Good morning, brothers and sisters, all the way. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, that's not going to cut it. All the way. All the way. <laughs> it's great to be here today. Uh, of course, uh, for what I've been through and in my age, it's great to be anywhere. <laughs> But uh, we talk about a, a, a family reunion, and uh, you know, we're all bonded, unified by that symbol, that crest, the family crest. And within that larger family, there is the regiments, different regiments, different brigades, different units, and we're all fiercely proud of what those are, but we're all uh, together as the uh, 82nd. Um, which is by far the most unique fightingist organization in the history of the world. Hua! <laughs> Absolutely. Double hua, if, uh, if I could get that. Um, what, uh, uh, you're in luck today because uh, you get to listen to a fossil talk about something that happened 50 some years ago. Um, it's a living history because obviously we're still around. Um, but it's a journey, and what I did was uh, uh, compile uh, pictures, stories, accounts, interviews, uh, the, uh, uh, the official history of the, of the 3rd Brigade in Vietnam, and pull it all together in a book called The 3rd the Brigade. Uh, it's an overlooked part of history. It's, it happened, uh, but people didn't pay attention to either the story or there were bigger issues involved. And what I found was, um, uh, it was a journey of discovery for me to find out what exactly the brigade did, what the division did, and uh, who were the people involved. And uh, boy, I want to tell you, I, uh, somebody asked me why I like the 82nd Airborne so much. And I said, well, I love characters. Uh, and you, you'll find a, you'll find a bunch of characters, but there are also characters with character. Uh, there's something essential uh, in that. Um, I love your concept, uh, family and friends, uh, and all generation airborne. Um, and the division history goes back to World War One uh, with the All Americans, um, the paratroopers of World War Two. Um, the generation went to Vietnam, the generation that went to uh, uh, Desert Storm, Iraq and Saudi Arabia, uh, and then, then again in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq again. You say, well, what, what is it that ties everything together? And there, there is a bond. Uh, it doesn't matter what generation you're in or why you were called to do what you do, there is a spirit, an essence, something about the airborne that carries through uh, multi-generations, just like there you would be with, with, with a family. Um, uh, in my private life, I've done um, uh, a, a lot of writing. I was a writer for 50 years uh, uh, before I retired. And uh, when I did retire, I did some, um, some family work, some genealogy, and it came in very handy in doing this book on Vietnam because uh, you get the essence of uh, who was the patriarch, uh, who were the key players, uh, who were some of the family members. So here we are at a different branch of the family and uh, um, talking about what this organization does throughout history, and that is the stand up for the little, little guy, the Soldiers of Liberty, um, the America's Guard of Honor, those aren't names that just come about uh, because somebody made them up. Those are, those are all true. Uh, and in, in Vietnam, the mission was, um, I'll back up just for a second, um, the, uh, the August Mines at the Pentagon, the Brain Trust uh, that uh, runs the show, uh, had decided that the 82nd Airborne was not going to go to Vietnam. They needed, uh, uh, much like in Korea, um, the country needed a, a strategic reserve that was ready to go to war at a moment's notice in case something big happened in Europe with the Russians or, or something else. So it was off the table for the 82nd to go to Vietnam, except in February, January, February 1968, the Tet Offensive. 
Uh, the strategy for fighting the war in Vietnam just got turned on its ear. Uh, troops were needed immediately to put out the uh, uprising uh, of the uh, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. And uh, uh, frankly, the, uh, uh, the system was uh, so broken down, there wasn't much left. There wasn't anything else left to go but the 82nd Airborne. Um, and William S. Westmoreland himself, who was the uh, commander in chief of ground forces, uh, specifically asked for 4,000 paratroopers um, to uh, uh, fly in um, to the northern part of the country, um, South Vietnam, up near Hue, which was the uh, original um, um, uh, imperial capital. That's where the emperors used to, to, to uh, rule from. Uh, and it was still teetering. Uh, battles were still going on when the 82nd arrived. So the 82nd arrived to uh, put down the uprising, it said offensive. Um, the original order was for three months, temporary assignment. Uh, we know how those things go. That three months uh, turned into a 22-month slog, uh, not only in the Hue area up north, uh, but for the uh, final um, 12, 11, 12 months uh, 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 at Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. And the uh, idea was that uh, uh, the 82nd as a fire brigade, as a mobile brigade, would protect the northern and western approaches to the city uh, so that they would spare Saigon, the, uh, uh, the onslaught of the uh, uh, North, North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. Um, Lyndon Baines Johnson had called up the Airborne and sent him to Vietnam, and Richard M. Nixon, um, who became president, uh, uh, elected in 1968, uh, gave the order to bring him home. Um, those are the two bookends uh, of Vietnam. So um, what I thought I, I'd just give you a little uh, uh, pictorial um, review of what Vietnam was like uh, who some of these people were. Uh, we're honored today to have in our presence some Golden Brigade members. Um, uh, we have Phil Cronin, Claude Dunn, Dwayne So. And these, these gentlemen are the living essence of, uh, of the 82nd in, in Vietnam. And if you get a chance and you want to pick, pick your brain, pick their brains and uh, they get a few, up, yes. yeah, and uh, have a few chuckles along the way. This is where this is where you're going. So, uh, um, uh, thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for inviting me. I want to thank Chris, especially for reaching out, um, because uh, uh, it is a family uh, that bond. It's unbreakable. It can't be torn apart. It binds you for life, um, and. Uh, been called the Brotherhood of the Silk. Uh, we have sisters now too. Uh, we have uh, uh, different kinds of uh, 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 material that goes into the shoot, but uh, the family of the synthet synthetic fabric doesn't quite have the ring as Brotherhood of the Silk. <laughs> so we'll go with that. This was the uh, uh, official poster after uh, 50 years on the division recreated a uh, helicopter scene. It was called the Helicopter War, but make no mistake about it, uh, it wasn't just helicopters. You know, the foot sloggers and the ground pounders walked a lot of the way. The uh, fighting was all over the place, in villages, in cities, in rice paddies, in jungles, in rainforests, and kind of enemies that always also fought underground. So above ground, underground, wherever it was, this was unlike any other war. How is this called a Golden Brigade? Everything else about the 82nd, everything else about the Army is a number, right? Uh, 508, 505. It's one of those things where how could you get a name like this? Well, it turns out that the uh, 3rd Brigade of the 82nd Airborne had been deployed to Detroit in 1967 uh, when the city was on fire during some race riots. Uh, they got uh, sent to Detroit to put down the uh, 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 urban unrest. Um, there was a big jump in uh, Vieques Island, Puerto Rico. The 3rd Brigade was part of that. And the uh, 
three-star general who headed the 18th Airborne Corps, uh, General Throckmorton, who also was a former commander of the 82nd, uh, had told the uh, commander of the, uh, of the 3rd Brigade, Bud Bowling, uh, said, Bud, everything your brigade touches turns to gold. And uh, one of the intelligence sergeants, when they got the word that they were going to Vietnam on this emergency deployment, said, well, if uh, everything we touch turns to gold, we must be the gold brigade. And uh, they, uh, Duke Dewey is in the Hall of Fame of the 82nd uh, uh, Airborne Museum. Um, uh, that uh, it became, it was on their letterhead, it was part of the official correspondence, and it, it lasted only for the 22 months that the uh, brigade was in Vietnam. So it was a golden brigade, um, all that they touched turned to gold, uh, yeah, that's true, but there were some, uh, definitely some, uh, some moments that uh, uh, were a little hairier than that. Got to Vietnam, and uh, they flew on the C-141s for the first time on a major operation and went into Chu Lai, which is about 100 miles south of Way. Said, well, why can't you land us closer at Da Nang? Well, Da Nang was closed uh, because of the Vietnam uh, NVA attacks and the Viet Cong attacks. Landed at Chu Lai, and all they had to do was go over this 25-mile pass just to get to where they were going. And uh, this is the most dangerous road in Vietnam uh, in peacetime. If you put a couple of thousand soldiers in some trucks and with all their gear, and they're heading up this serpentine highway with all these uh, uh, potential uh, ambush points along the way, this road was closed. But the 82nd opened it up and got up north. It started right away and it, uh, it continued. I'll give you one more from the High Van Pass. They called it the Pass Through the Clouds. Uh, it was so high that the uh, clouds, the weather, would sit on top of the point. Uh, and this is a, an old imperial fort that was built maybe 1,200 years ago. But it shows you that this area was of particular concern to uh, invading armies. This was a camp they built outside of Way, um, Camp Rodriguez, named for Joe Rodriguez, the first brigade casualty, killed by a booby trap during training before they went north. It's a dangerous place. In the background here, uh, Camp Rodriguez, but that's uh, the Laotian border there, where uh, the uh, communists could bring troops down from the north and uh, see them into the fighting here. Uh, lovely little place, Camp Rodriguez, I don't know if you see the, uh, the shower here. Uh, the cold water was in the red barrel and the hot water was in the blue barrel with a little, uh, little heater on it there. But uh, yeah. just tremendous, tremendous conditions. Yeah, it felt. One thing you have to uh, tell them that most of that stuff that you see there was stolen. <laughs> we stole it. I, I can we verify it. From the Marines, I, the Army, wherever we could get it. I can, I, I, I can verify this. So you send a, send a brigade over, a separate brigade. Uh, it didn't have the division command structure, didn't have the supply, didn't have procurement. Um, so they landed them there and said, okay, you're on your own, go fight the war. Um, well, um, didn't have tents, didn't have uh, anything you need to put up a camp. But um, the Marines were up around the way and they had a huge supply dump. Huge. They got stuff in that you couldn't believe. Well, uh, take a couple of enterprising paratroopers who might put on a, uh, get a uh, marine requisition form, um, and you could uh, you get yourself some tents, some coils, some concert concertina wires, sandbags, anything you needed. Uh, uh, and uh, you're right, it wasn't what they carried over. It was, uh, it was what they could find while they were there. Um, a lot of, uh, 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 the, the people you see in the movies and on the, uh, the MASH episodes uh, who can find uh, supplies anywhere. This was the city of Way, and uh, it's divided by the Perfume River, and the Perfume River does not smell like perfume, I can tell you that right now. But this was a situation that they found themselves into, and uh, like I said, they fought in the cities, 
they fought in the villages, and you mentioned uh, earlier, I uh, was interested in the Iraq presentation, uh, displaced population of civilians. And yet these two colliding forces uh, going at it with rapid fire weapons, that's fine. But in between, these mostly innocent civilians uh, who lost their homes, their occupations, their way to make a living, and they just became nomads. They were out on the road. There's a, a, a little bit about the foot power that they used in their exploits. This road, which is called Highway 547, not very much of a going concern as a highway, is it? This was cut through the jungle and the, and the rainforest from Hway City all the way out to the border. Uh, there were a string of fire bases along the way, too. Fire base Boyd, close to uh, Hawaii, uh, fire base uh, Birmingham, about midway, and uh, fire base Bastogne, right near the border. And there was a lot of action that went on up there. Um, and if I may, I'll d diverge just for a second. The 1st Battalion of 508 was one of the uh, uh, key combat components of the 3rd Brigade. You had two battalions from the 505, the first and the second, and then the first of the 508. And the uh, record gets a little overlooked for a number of reasons. Um, one, this mission was classified at first, um, and then uh, uh, so nobody was supposed to know about it. And, and two, uh, with the brigade, was placed under the operational control of first the Marines, and then the 101st Airborne. Um, so it became part of a larger unit. And uh, uh, Colonel Bowling, Bud Bowling, World War II veteran, um, escaped uh, a prison camp uh, and, uh, and, and fought like hell. Taught at the Pentagon, um, taught at West Point. Um, uh, when they arrived, the uh, commanding general of the 101st, uh, uh, Major General Barsanti said, okay, Bowling, you guys are part of my outfit now. I want you to put that Screaming Eagle patch on. And uh, Colonel Bowling, Colonel talking to a two-star, said, uh, said, sir, I'll be happy to wear that patch on any part of my uniform, including my back hip pocket, but that 82nd Airborne stays on my shoulder at all times. And he preserved the identity of the 82nd um, in the early part of Vietnam, and it lived through uh, the entire part of Vietnam. Um, and he also said, when I put that shoulder patch on, I want the red, white, and blue dress patch, the one that stands out, the one you can't miss. I don't want any of this subdued camouflage 82nd in the jungle patch because I want these people to know who's killing them. And that's, that's the way he was. He was, uh, he was all soldier. Um, this is the, uh, this m looks more like down south uh, than, than up north. And, and I will say, it's ancient history. It's happened 50 years ago. But if you're a 19, 20 year old young person and you're away on one of these deployments, uh, you find out that it's going to be the most important thing you're going to do in your life. This is, the, this is it. There's no, nothing more intense, nothing more significant than this deployment. It happens when you're 19, 20 years old. So many of these guys kept journals or um, uh, notebooks and uh, uh, just wrote things down to have it. And uh, uh, there were no selfies back in the day. You know, we all can take pictures of anything we want. But uh, there were these uh, Instamatic Kodak cameras, 12 pictures on a roll, uh, kind of a fuzzy picture. But guys preserved their pictures from Vietnam, and then as they got older in life, donated them to the museum. So they're on, on file with the museum in Fort Bragg, but nobody sees them. So this was a way to bring them out and to uh, take advantage of some of the uh, 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 pictures that they did shoot over there. Um, helicopter war, jungle war, elephant grass war. Elephant grass is the highest grass in the world. It grows to about 10, 12 feet high because it's in the tropics. You compete for 
sunlight, you compete for nutrients, the grass grows that big, and uh, the way to get through it was usually to chop through it with a machete, and a, a guy on point would chop for like eight minutes or so until he got so tired he couldn't move, and the next guy would step up, and they would just keep going and going and going until they got through. A uh, little bit of a, a light anti-tank weapon in the, uh, in the woods there. That's bamboo. Bamboo. This is one of the uh, helicopter missions. And these things could happen uh, at any time. Popper flights, eagle flights, get on the chopper, where are we going? I don't know, we'll tell you when we get there. <laughs> and uh, you run to them and you run from them. Um, it, was, uh, it was quite an amazing place. Now, this is, am I am, uh, correct in saying this was Birmingham? Well, okay, it's just the fire base on top of the hill with the security below it. Um, and they're taking a wounded man out here towards the chopper to get on the, on the life flight. Um, there it is there. And uh, I mentioned these up near Hawaii, the uh, imperial capital. Um, these are temples, shrines, pagodas. Uh, they even had cremation urns. Uh, where they would uh, uh, dispose of the bodies of the uh, emperors that had died, and uh, this was all part of the Buddhist tradition, the Vietnamese uh, tradition. There was actually one battle inside a temple that uh, somebody saw a VC run inside, they ran in, checked them out, ran around, they were uh, gunfire exchanged and everything else. They found a trap door where the VC had gone underground, and uh, a couple of guys from the 82nd just uh, laid them out in a fist fight. But they did fight in temples. They fought in any kind of uh, uh, terrain imaginable. Uh, here's a, a picture of a person you might recognize today. He's with us today, Claude Dunn, ladies and gentlemen, on his 106. It's a great story in the book about Claude and that 106, but I'll have to, you'll have to read it to find out, yeah. We'll tell you about that later on. Now, uh, back in the day, Claude was quite the, uh, what do you call him, uh, Phil, butt ugly? Is that what the, <laughs> yeah. I was only 25. Two guys who go to war together, owe their lives to each other, stood shoulder to shoulder, and said airborne. I uh, mean, if you listen to them talk, you swear they were mortal enemies. <laughs> but that's, that's the way families work. That was, uh, and that was Birmingham. That was Birmingham, I mean. Um, Get the mortars in the field. There's the, yeah, the big deuce, and that's uh, the fire base going out to the Laotian border. You know, there's a, guy, a lot of guys, you look at pictures of Vietnam and say, well, these guys stand there with their shirts off. What's that all about? Well, that's a violation of uniform. Well, it was in the tropics. It was constantly wet. There were two seasons, the monsoon season, where it rained every day, and the uh, dry season, where it rained every other day. Um, shirts got wet, everything got wet, everything smelled like mildew or a wet dog, and to keep a weapon firing in Vietnam, you had to make sure that it was uh, up to speed with, uh, with oil and lubricants and uh, did not have the supply capability that uh, maybe some other units had. Guys cut up their t-shirts to oil their weapons. What was more important, wearing a t-shirt or uh, having a working weapon? So. Uh, um, that's part of the Perfume River. It, it flows south to north, and you see the uh, rainforest and the mountains there in the background, which is where Charlie and the NVA just uh, fought a war. Viet Cong was part of an insurgency, basically. That was uh, half the population of South Vietnam was aligned with the Communist North. Then there were regular army troops that the North Vietnamese sent down. They did not elect to just form a line and stand and fight. They had no chance in that kind of a situation. So they stayed concealed as much as possible also. So that it was a real bear just trying to find these people and uh, uh, see if they were willing to uh, you know, engage. One of the big battles, this was actually the uh, deadliest day for the brigade in Vietnam. Uh, lost uh, 10 people in one day, April 6th, 
1968. Uh, the river forms a uh, roughly the shape of a W. You see on uh, maybe the Washington Nationals baseball team with the loopies. And there was a contingent of enemy right in the, in the apex of that first W and had to go in and dig them out. That was quite a fight. When we talk about the brigade being in Vietnam in 1968-69, what else happened in American history in 1968-1969? Well, um, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Cities were burning. There was civil unrest everywhere. Uh, politics was, uh, was off the scale. There were riots at the nominating conventions. Uh, a new president was elected uh, to bring the troops home. Um, uh, men landed on the moon for the first time. Um, Woodstock, there was a, a big cohort of the population that wasn't going to go to Vietnam, decided, well, we could go to concerts in New York and uh, uh, live our uh, lifestyle out in San Francisco. So uh, it was different, different time. There was so much happening, you could almost not keep up with it uh, in 68 and 69. This was another big battle, uh, this series of villages right outside Way. Actually, at the time when this happened, company commander called in 26 airstrikes against this line of villages. 12 hours in a day, that's you know two strikes per hour, and they would just come rolling in. It was just one incredible scene, but because this was close enough to the coast, the Navy opened up with some 16-inch guns on a battleship. They were lobbing in one-ton shells over this stuff, and uh, just, just incredible. Now, this was uh, an ambush on that highway, I told you, 547. We would run supplies from Hawaii all the way out to Firebase Bastogne out here in the jungle. Very contested uh, territory. The NBA had set up an ambush on May 5. They were going to wipe out a whole convoy, they, and they had it planned. They had the high ground. They had their mortars. They had troops hidden in the jungle. As soon as they got to a, a certain point, they were just going to spring this. Well, something went wrong. It, it got uh, sprung early in the darndest fight just broke out. It was, it was all day long, and uh, this, was a, this was a 508 battle. Um, they, uh, uh, they were able to suppress the ambushers became the ambushed, and the, uh, 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 that road stayed open. That convoy was not hit. Um, there wasn't uh, a single casualty lost uh, uh, after this battle. Of course, there, was, uh, there were uh, American casualties involved here. One of the interesting things I found out, uh, it's 82nd Airborne, the All-Americans, every state in the Union. Um, one of the officers killed here, a forward, opera, a forward observer for the artillery, uh, was a citizen of Switzerland. He had been in the Swiss Army. Okay. He joined the 82nd Airborne because he thought that would be an easier way for him to become a U.S. citizen. He wanted to become an American citizen. <clears throat> His papers, all the paperwork was, uh, was in the system. It was all going forward. Uh, he got killed in May. His uh, citizenship was approved in June. But there were others um, who were in the 82nd, uh, including uh, probably a dozen or so Canadians. I said, well, Vietnam, wait, uh, there were American kids who were burning draft cards and deserting to Canada so they didn't have to go fight this war, so they were going to Canada, but at the same time, there were Canadian young men who were coming south to fight in the American army, which was technically against the law in Canada, that you cannot serve uh, in uh, another country's army in time of war, but they did it anyway. They were an equal... Uh, Maybe 30,000 deserters. There were probably 30,000 Canadians that came to uh, fight uh, for the uh, United States in Vietnam, including those in, uh, in the Golden Brigade. There was a medic killed in that action I just saw on uh, 547, uh, Ernie Doc Payne. And they put uh, the dispensary on uh, Firebase Bastogne was named in his honor. Uh, so anytime anybody went to get treated for a wound, they were reminded of Ernest Payne. 
That's 1505. Charlie Company. And this was after one of the big battles. You see, there's not, there's not much left of the terrain. There's some pretty gnarly looking characters there. Didn't matter what color, creed, political affiliation. When you were out there, you wore olive drab green. You were an all-American. Again, one of the uh, pictures of the uh, foot patrols. One of the interesting things about Vietnam, most of it happened at night. This enemy did not want to fight out in the broad daylight, out in the open. So you adapt to the other guy's tactics. One of the uh, early tactics of the brigade was to set up night ambushes. Two uh, squads and, and platoons would set up places and uh, try to pick these people off as they were moving at night. Most of the stuff in Vietnam happened at night. Daytime was when you uh, moved to the next location or rested. You know, it's a lovely weather. I mentioned the monsoon, it rains every day, and then the dry season, it rains every other day. Me. The mud. Burnham was only 100 feet from the Perfume River. You're right. It was right up above it. Yeah. 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 Uh, Colonel Carpenter, CIB, two-star on it, uh, called, he had his medium tents up on the top there, and he'd send out little messages to the commander saying, be it the view at 1500. He's talking he talk about the view from his tent from over the Perfume River. Because he, it, was a, it was a real great spot. <laughs> One of the things, um, when I first took on this project, uh, a little bit of a story involved there. Uh, um, but when I was talking to guys, I said, you know, do you really want to go back and talk about Vietnam. Do you want to relive these experiences? Some of them are very painful. A lot of guys had never talked about it in 50 years. Just shut it off. Did their jobs, came home, country was different, just went back to civilian life without ever really forgetting because you don't, you don't ever shut it off. And the, the reason that some of them agreed to talk for the first time in 50 years or wanted this story told because it's part of our history, it's part of American history. To remember the 227 who didn't come back, um, the Golden Brigade chapter calls them their forever young. Um, these are people that died uh, in, their, in their very young years. So to remember them not only as a number, 227, or the names on a memorial, but flesh and blood human beings, somebody's son and daughter, somebody's spouse, somebody's brother or sister. And uh, where they were from, hometowns, what they, um, what they did and what they hoped to, uh, to, to accomplish in life. So um, that was my goal um, in, in writing the book, was to capture the history, but also to remember the uh, 227 that didn't return. Um, they ranged in age from 18 to 43, from a private E2 to a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel. Um, there were cooks, clerks, artillerymen, cavalrymen, um, and of course grunts, the, the infantry, um, from uh, all occupations in the military to all occupations in, uh, in civilian life. Another view of that same mountain, but uh, if you see this here, that's a fury from the sky shield crest. In the uh, in the time that it was there, the 508th was the recipient of a valorous unit citation. Fought in two really big battles up north near Hawaii, and uh, also one uh, down south near Saigon that very few people know about. And uh, I, I take a quick survey. To, how many people will recognize the name Bob Hope? <laughs> All right, the old troubadour, the one man um, morale I've show. Seen from, one time in my life, yeah. Yeah. From World War II on, he would take a, a, a troop uh, out to visit the uh, soldiers in the field, uh, cheer them up, give them a show, get their mind off the war for a day or two. Um, 1968, Bob Hope was due to perform um, right outside of Saigon at Long Bin, biggest base in Vietnam. Um, there were going to be uh, 30,000 soldiers in attendance. Bob Hope was going to do a show. 
Anne Margaret was there with her mini skirt and she was singing dancing in the streets. Well, you look at you look at this uh, from the other side's point of view, you say, well, there's a target of opportunity if there ever was one. Um, and they they actually had formulated plans where they were going to move in some uh, some rockets, some 122s, and some mortars, and they were going to hit the Bob Hope show just as he was performing. Now that would have been just an absolute disaster. To provide security, the Army, in its infinite wisdom, pulled the 1st Battalion of the 508th out of country, essentially stopped the war for about a week. Uh, two companies were involved in security inside the wire, and then two companies were outside uh, along the canal and river system to watch for any movement to, uh, uh, to cut off any possible attack. Well, um, I mentioned most of this stuff happens at night. Um, there was one platoon from one company on the far end of the last canal, and about 9 o'clock at night, saw some movement coming in. And uh, uh, there's no propulsion on these sampans. They come in with the tide. They were so close to the ocean that the tide would rise and the boats would come in. Then the tide would fall and the boats would come out. Well, they're coming in on the tide as sneaky as you can be, not making a sound. And uh, a gentleman's name, Frank Cunane from New Jersey, um, says, oh, there's something wrong with this. So he says, lie day, come here. Well, nobody stopped. Nobody stopped in Vietnam. It was dark and there was a sampan, but well, he opened up. Uh, he opened up and then the rest of the platoon opened up and then 29 sampans were wrecked that night. They, found, they got 29 boats loaded with rocket tripods and rockets and mortar shells, called in gunships, they called in a spooky, they called in, called in everything. And after, uh, after it was all over and the smoke cleared, the show went on without a hitch at Long Bin. And uh, Bob Hope uh, said that uh, he had planned to spend his, Christ his Christmas in 1968 in the States, but he didn't like violence, so he came to Vietnam. <laughs> and and uh, I don't know if anybody is ever going to really fully appreciate what the 508 did in saving that show and saving that fiasco and preventing this fiasco from happening, um, but they did. They saved Christmas. There's a Grinch that stole Christmas, and there's Fury from the Sky that saved Christmas. Oh, um, you know, that highway we were talking about, they built this road through the jungle, just plowed it with the Rome plows. Now it's surrounded by jungles on two sides, so that's not very good. Uh, somebody got the great idea, well, well, we got this stuff laying around, we could uh, devegetate the jungle. Uh, it's called Agent Orange. So they dropped a bunch of Agent Orange along the road to kill off the vegetation, and they would come through with flamethrower trucks and burn it off. So they would try to get 100 meters of uh, clearance on each side of the road. Not, not that it mattered much. I mean, if you're sitting in ambush uh, uh, out at 200 meters, 100 meters doesn't make all that much difference. Um, uh, this is one of the guys that was killed in action at that Lazy W battle, Larry Coger, first lieutenant. He was wounded early in the fight and the right arm, and they uh, said, uh, LT, you better get out of here. Uh, uh, that wound's pretty bad. And he said, no, I can't leave. I can't leave my men. You know what shock can do after a wound? And uh, he died the next day in the infirmary. There we go. Yeah, just, just a picture of Birmingham there. Yeah. And, you know, that's not special effects from the light. That's the way the sun would come down through. And again, the choppers. Um, I, I'll wrap this up real quick because I know we're, we're running a little bit behind schedule. And if there's anybody has any questions, uh, uh, I want you to uh, take the opportunity now. But uh, again, th thank you for the opportunity to invite me to speak about a missing chapter of airborne history and uh, American history. And uh, Chris has graciously uh, invited me to uh, uh, have some books on hand at the hospitality suite tonight. So I'll be autographing some books in case you want to look or, or, or buy a, a, a copy of it. So uh, uh, look forward to catching up with you uh, uh, some more th uh, then. But I will tell you this. Um, 
A2nd Airborne in Vietnam did its job. It did its job. Now, nobody gets much credit for doing the job. Uh, the way they were treated when they came home was uh, absolutely shameful. And yet, and yet, they stayed together. That bond of brotherhood, that thing that links them together, the thing that separated them from the rest of their uh, kids in, in, in the population um, brings them together. We can't lose that. So I uh, just want to give a, uh, 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 just a nod to the organization in general and the people in particular who participate. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay, that's going to be easy.